So Howard's presentation is a good segue into what I'm going to, to speak about here today. What I'm going to focus on is recent U.S. Circuit Court and District Court decisions and trends in paragraph four disputes in particular. And a um, little overview of, of the things that I'm going to touch on. I don't think anybody can talk about 2013 without talking about reverse payment agreements and what has happened in that space. We've had some happenings in the safe harbor uh, area, pleading requirements, determination of infringement, and obviousness of uh, compound claims. Some interesting happenings in the courts in both of those areas. Let's start with the uh, reverse payments. And what I'm talking about here is the FTC v. Octavia Supreme Court case. I think most of you have probably heard much about this. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it just very briefly and, and give you some of the takeaways. Um, the, the setup is there were a number of circuits uh, that applied what was a somewhat lenient standard for settlement agreements. And it was essentially as long as the agreement did not exclude the exclusionary potential of the patents that were at issue in that particular agreement, settlement wouldn't violate antitrust laws. Uh, Third Circuit took the opposite view and essentially took the view of, of the FTC where these types of agreements were presumptively illegal and that there need to be uh, proof put forth in order to show otherwise. Supreme Court took it up. FTC stuck with their argument of, of reverse payments being um, presumptively illegal. Defendants put out what's been referred to as the scope of the patent rule. And in a 5-3 decision, the court essentially rejected both positions. What did it do? Basically went back to the, the basics of antitrust law and said you need to apply the rule of reason. Look at the facts of each case and determine whether through patent uh, analysis uh, or otherwise, uh, determine whether there's anti-competitive effects with respect to the, the agreements and weigh those against the pro-competitive benefits in the marketplace. Uh, of that agreement. What does this mean practically? Um, a lot uh, fewer potential sediments likely because of the unknowns that are going to come out of this, a lot more um, leeway to challenge settlement agreements. Reverse payment settlements will likely, if they are entered into, lead to pro protracted antitrust litigation, um, one in which defendants can no longer invoke this lenient scope of the, the patent defense, which was somewhat of a, a safe harbor for entering, into, entering into those agreements. And as many of you know, in the antitrust context, could potentially expose the parties to mandatory trouble damages. So a lot at stake in this area, and it's put a lot of question as to what's going to happen going forward uh, with respect to these types of, of settlement or what they're referred to as reverse payment agreements. So let's now move on to uh, Safe Harbor. Just to set the stage, there's a statutory provision in U.S. patent law whereby uh, there's essentially a safe harbor for any um, testing, any uses that may violate a patent as long as the, um, the use of that invention is for purposes of development and submission of information under federal law. Uh, particularly for um, drugs, veterinary, biological products. So how has this played out? It's somewhat of a vague uh, provision, and there's been um, debate in the Federal Circuit on, on this issue. It's gone back and forth. But at the end of the day, in, in this Momenta v. Amphistar case, the uh, Fed Circuit interpreted this, this statute very broadly. And um, here's a direct quote from the, uh, from the, the Fed Circuit decision that the language unambiguously applies to submissions under any federal law providing that the law regulates manufacture, use, or sale of drugs. The court went on to say that um, the safe harbor is not limited to pre-approval activities. Prior to this point, the Fed Circuit has, had essentially indicated that this provision would not apply to post-approval activities and that um, information that is actually submitted 
to the FDA. That's not a limitation. It may be a requirement of the FDA, and if you're keeping it in your file cabinet for purposes of complying with FDA requirements, that's enough. And it's also okay if the information has alternative uses, fundraising, uh, and other business purposes, as long as it has a legal, uh, a legal um, basis as well. So what happened? As a result of that holding by the Fed Circuit, bounced back to the District of Massachusetts, granted summary judgment in favor of Amphistar. And that was because the patent that was at issue in that case related to methods of comparing the generic version of Lovenox to the branded version. So the, um, the argument was that the reason that this data was being generated was for purposes of, of FDA requirements, and the, and the district court agreed based on the Fed Circuit direction. Similar case in Southern District of New York, Teva v. Sandoz, very similar situation, patent in that case related to polypeptide markers and methods of comparing generic Capaxone to the branded version of Capaxone. And in that case, um, the, uh, the court granted a motion to dismiss, didn't even go past the pleading stage uh, for failures to state a claim upon which relief could be granted for Sandoz. And it was on the same rationale that the patent was directed to a uh, method that uh, they were generating data for purposes of complying with FDA requirements. Moving on to pleading requirements, couple interesting decisions in this space. I wouldn't otherwise um, pick this as, a, as an area of, of focus, but I, I thought it was particularly interesting just to set the stage, pleading requirements generally, folks um, view it as just a, a notice pleading. You don't have to put a whole lot of, of information in, into the complaint necessarily, but that has changed relatively release recently with the Twombly Iqbal uh, double decisions from the, the Supreme Court, where they essentially said there must, must be enough facts to make plausible, not merely possible or conceivable. That, there will be, that they will be able to prove the facts to support the claim that are uh, laid out in the complaint. Legal conclusions are not enough, and there has to be some level of facts pled. How is this played out in a couple district court decisions? Very interesting. Uh, Novartis, Walkhart decision from uh, District of New Jersey. Number of allegations in the complaint. The bottom line was that the court found and, and dismissed a couple of the basis for infringement um, because the uh, Novartis was unable to show that the generic defendants were seeking approval for products that were actually part of the, the patent. And um, quote here that I pulled from the complaint, patentee had not sufficiently pled or demonstrated how certain defendants Section 8 certifications are misleading or improper. So the um, Novartis was, was pleading an inducement of infringement claim, and because they had not pled sufficient facts to support that claim, the district court uh, dismissed, based on the complaint, those, um, those complaints or those claims. Um, and mainly because the uh, Novartis had not laid out or failed to identify any, any explicit direction or instruction that's required to prove an inducement of infringement claim, and rather just had legal conclusions. Interesting decision. And um, this is played out in another uh, related or another uh, case, this one out of the District of Delaware, Cumberland and Pharma. Similar type of situation where the, um, the branded or the, the Cumberland had pled um, and boasted about its patented invention and that one of the main reasons that they uh, thought that their invention was, in, was um, something of, of worth was that it did not include a chelating agent. And of course, uh, one of the things that Innopharma's Innova product did include was a chelating agent. And because of that, the court found that based on the pleadings alone, um, there was no basis to support the complaint. Determination of infringement, a little, little bit of a uh, ominous title, but I think you'll get the gist of where I'm going with, with this decision. Interesting, Synovian versus Teva out of the Fed Circuit. Um, the court essentially held that if an ANDA 
describes an aspect of a defendant's product that is determinative of infringement, then the and is description of the product controls. You can't bring any other evidence in. That's what you look at, and that's what you look at in a loan. What Teva tried to do here, well, let me a little bit, uh, let me talk about the patent first to set the stage. The patent covered compositions of a drug that included less than a certain percentage, and the percentage was 0.25 percent of a particular ingredient. The ANDA that Teva had filed sought approval for a product that had that particular ingredient between 0 and 0.6 percent of that ingredient. That's what was laid out in the application filed with the FDA. Defendant or Teva tried to come in later and said, uh, providing a declaration from one of their employees, that the product would always be outside the range in the patent. In other words, that it would always contain between 0.3 and 0.6 percent of the ingredients, so falling outside of the scope of the patent claims. Well, the court said, that's nice, but it's irrelevant. We don't look to extraneous evidence. We only look to what you said in your application that was submitted to the FDA, and for that reason, um, they were found to infringe. Obviousness of compound claims. This has been um, a subject of, of much debate in the U.S. Very difficult to challenge a compound claim. Um, if you see a, a compound claim listed in an orange book for a particular product, it's likely difficult to find a basis to invalidate that claim. And it's um, something that's often very sought after on the branded side to get coverage from that standpoint of covering the compound that's the subject of a, a product. This, uh, this case was a unique case, I thought, that came out in 2013. Bristol Myers Squibb versus Tava, again out of Delaware. And in this case, um, the court actually concluded that the compound claim was invalid as obvious. Uh, this patent that was subject of, of this case was directed to Baraclude. And um, essentially, what we were dealing with here, you can see the two uh, compounds side by side. Enkavir is a carboxylic nucleoside analog that mimics the naturally occurring nucleoside 2 prime deoxyguanosine, or DG. You see that on uh, your left, and then the um, the product that was uh, the patented compound is on your left, or your right, excuse me. What did the court conclude? Um, 100 and, was it? This is, this is a magistrate judge, Burke, out of Delaware. 171 page opinion. I pu pulled out some snippets which will be of interest to you. Uh, going through much of the logic that had been laid out by the Fed Circuit of how do you analyze uh, compound claims and walk through that analysis, essentially concluded that a chemist of ordinary skill in the art would have selected 2 prime CDG, a compound similar to Enkavir as the lead compound. And that's um, on your left. You see that compared to the, the, pro or the uh, compound that's, that's the subject of the claim and what the court concluded based on a substantial amount of expert testimony as well as uh, on both sides of, of, the, of the V and essentially concluding that an ordinary medicinal chemist having selected the two prime CDG as the lead compound would have had reason to and been motivated to alter that compound to, to get the, uh, the protected compound that was subject to the patent. Long decision, interesting decision, but I think it provides and sh shines some light on potential avenues for challenging compound claims down the road. Still a fact-specific uh, fact, fact analysis, and um, certainly not, uh, the takeaway is not going to be that this is going to set the stage for easier uh, challenge of compound claims, but certainly shed some light as, as a potential. This has um, obviously been appealed to the Fed Circuit. The argument was in December, so we'll see how this turns out fairly soon. Thanks very much.